Everyone hates Mondays. I'm not the exception to this. Well, I hate Monday in particular. I don't hate them all. Just one. The one I'm stuck in. Or on, perhaps. I don't really know how to refer to this dilemma. If it's truly a dilemma. We succeeded in the Mori experiment. Time is frozen. It's just... I'm the only one here. Currently, I'm sitting at my desk recording these events in the office I shared with Dr. Parsons. I wish the university would have let him keep his position as a physical science professor. Chris was as smart as they come, but he's limited when it comes to financial matters. I suppose a job is a job. It definitely was the better alternative offered to him following the experiment. Dr. Christopher Parsons and I are, were, scientists. Well, scientists in the sense that we convinced a legitimate educational institution to finance our studies into the applications of time manipulation. Yes, that's right. Time manipulation is a real thing. Time, as most people know it, is simply a unit of measurement. Minutes, hours, days, years. All units devised so humans can place a number on things. It's a weird obsession we have. None of that is real. Tangible. However, it's undeniable that time exists. Organisms age. Seasons come and go. Food decays. Nothing known to man could escape the reality, until Dr. Parsons and I discovered the Billimite. Yes, as you probably guessed, we really enjoyed Groundhog Day. It was very appropriate given our intentions. The Billimite is a phenomenal creature. Most people are familiar with the Tardigrade, a virtually indestructible, microscopic creature that can even live exposed in space. Yes, that is cool. However, the Billimite is infinitely more sensational. The term mite is just used affectionately. This creature is closer to the size of a rat fetus and has fully developed, fully functioning body systems. It isn't a mammal, but its internal makeup is almost identical and the differences are negligible. What truly sets the Billimite apart is its inability to age. It simply cannot. Chris and I dissected dozens of these beings to discover their inner workings. They don't age. Not on the surface. Not on a cellular layer. They're frozen in time. We knew that harnessing the ability these things have to cease aging would be a breakthrough unlike anything ever seen by the human race. I mean, imagine the possibilities. The aging process could have been halted. Those with terminal illnesses could be put in suspension until a cure was created. Cryogenics had become increasingly popular, but our findings could have given people the same benefit without putting their lives on hold. Thus began the Murray experiment. The trials were only done on mice, terminally ill ones at that. We had a plethora of them, as there was an infectious disease research centre sharing the same university as us. I still question why they funded us, honestly. That's besides the point. Chris and I, well, we didn't exactly know where to start. Billamites don't age, but they also don't have anything in their biological makeup that appears to be the source of their power. So we started at the basics. The first trial was blood transfusions. While small, Billamites have a functioning circulatory system, complete with red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, the works. We had to use very, very thin needles, as the opaque white skin of the Billamites don't favour showing any veins. They're also incredibly smooth, and a bit of a pain to pin down. Once one got a needle through the subcaneous layer, the bilamites would begin writhing in pain. 
This, combined with their smooth skin, made it virtually impossible to land a second successful injection. The mice didn't respond well to the new blood. Their bodies began rapidly shutting down within one day of receiving the donor blood. Failure. Next, we skipped ahead and went with a more unconventional approach. Consumption. We took bilamites and carefully, and humanely Peter, removed various sections from their bodies to feed to the mice. Although we had dissected enough of them, cutting their limbs away was nothing short of bizarre. Upon applying pressure to an appendage, their bones would seem to vanish, and we would be making similar cuts to those of a fillet mignon with a butcher knife. If you can imagine a naked mole rat, 50 times smaller, that's the size of what we had to deal with, and we were still having many difficulties cutting away pieces. The mice that ate the body parts displayed symptoms similar to malaria and died within one week on ingestion. The trials were numerous and troublesome on Chris and I. We had many late nights discussing abandoning the experiment of scotch. Every time, maybe due to the alcohol, we managed to convince each other to persevere. One of our last resorts was stem cell injections. We had postponed attempting the technique due to the high chances of failure, but after months of various tests, we finally made the plunge. It was a Monday, 1.18pm, Eastern Standard Time. Dr. Parsons and I had every single thing perfectly prepared for the transplant. Extra restraints on the bilamite, over-sterilized equipment, multiple checks, multiple balances. We weren't willing to try this 20 times like the other simpler trials. I also used my two index fingers to attempt to keep the bilamite stable, when it would undoubtedly start convulsing. Chris stared at his needle as a drip of sweat made its way from my brow down to my beard. I was flush. The ticking from the wall clock ceased to exist. We were living in one moment, one last opportunity to finally save mankind from the inevitable. Chris began his approach with a needle. As the tip penetrated its skin, the bilamite let out a small yelp, like a puppy being left alone. We had never heard these creatures make noise before. Chris and I shared a glance, unsure what to do. We had already teetered on the ledge of ethics, but that noise unsettled both of us. It was infantile, a helpless baby crying for help from its mother. We searched the other face for an answer, and as I nodded to Chris to continue, a piercing pain shot at my hand into my head. The bilamite stabbed me with a thin, whisker-like protrusion from its head. I became severely lightheaded and moved back to sit up against the wall. I nodded off for a brief moment. When I awoke, Chris was on the ground in front of me, body lurched towards the ground, crying. I thought that my attempts to console him were fruitless because he was too far gone. Maybe he finally cracked. We were under a lot of stress due to the numerous failures in the Mori experiment. I ran down to the shared office of the psych professors, hoping they could help. I don't know why. It felt right not making a huge ordeal of the situation. This was a confidential matter between professionals, not a university-wide scandal. When I got to the office and knocked, the older female professor, Joyce, answered and looked directly at me, baffled. Then, she closed the door. I knocked again. Joyce opened the door, this time coming out into the hallway, before she closed the door again. I knocked for a third time. Joyce answered the door again, with an angry demeanour. Stop this nonsense, she snarled out of the doorway. 
she began to close the door. Joyce! I yelled as I grabbed her forearm. She fell to her knees. The other professor ran over to her side, asking if she needed a medic. No, no, it, it, it's fine. Just a ringing in my ear, that's all. I must have scraped my arm on the door. It burns a bit, but I'm fine. I briskly made my way back to Chris. I didn't have time for whatever games were going on or any ridiculous experiments those crazy old bats were conducting. Our lab was quarantined and guarded. Chris was gone. I didn't wait up. I walked back to my house on campus and started frantically looking up any breaking news stories. I needed to know what the media was saying. I needed to have a story ready for any interviews, good or bad. Nothing. It must have been too recent for the news outlets to have grabbed hold of it. I got a ping notifying me of a new email. Nate, I'm sorry. It should have been me. I never knew your family or friends, but if you are one of them and reading this, I loved Nate like a brother. I never would have continued our research had I known it would end up this way. I'm so, so, so sorry. Dr. Christopher Parsons, Ohio State University. The sincerity of his email finally set off a red flag that something was wrong. Chris wasn't an outwardly emotional person. Something happened to me during the Murray experiment. I responded to the email with a simple question. Chris, what happened? In his response, Dr. Parsons explained to me that I fell back into the wall and sat down. My body began to rapidly age, faster than ice in a hot soup, as he put it. Then it began to decompose into nothingness. There was no trace that I had ever been up against that wall. I was gone. I spent that entire day emailing Chris about everything besides the actual experiment. I was bitter about not finishing the stem cell transplant and avoided the topic like the plague. He wasn't arrested in my disappearance. The cameras that the university installed in our labs, unbeknownst to us, caught the same scenario he described to me. It was chalked up to the nature of the experiment. It was covered up and he was free to go immediately. While they could take months at a time to process a grant, they somehow were able to cover up a disaster and make a decision in regards to Chris's future in a few hours time. A few hours time? That wasn't right. It couldn't have been. In my years with the university and my run-ins with law enforcement, nothing processed that fast. Hell. I was killed on camera. It hit me. I asked Chris what day it was. Thursday. The same day my computer was showing me. The same day on the news on my phone. It hadn't dawned on me that I never slept after returning home, nor needed to use the facilities or eat and drink. I went to the bathroom and my unibrow hadn't grown in, as it has every couple days since puberty. Chris agreed to meet me Friday at noon to figure things out over coffee. I laid in bed that night, contemplating the circumstances surrounding my existence. I didn't sleep. Sun went down, moon came up, moon went down, sun came up. I got to Starbucks a little after Chris did. I almost burst into a full run when I saw him, and I jumped slightly onto his back when I got close, like old times. He collapsed, but got back up rather quickly, slightly red in the face. You okay? I asked him. He didn't respond, 
just stuck a pinky in his ear and gave it a quick wiggle. A moment or two later, he pulled out his phone and started typing me an email. Nate, sorry I missed you. I have to get to class. Let's link up ASAP. Chris. I responded immediately from my own phone. We went to the university separate, but together. We ran experiments in the infectious disease lab. Chris would tell me what to do, and I would do it, or object via email. First objective, grab a mouse, simple. I placed my hand on top of the one that Chris placed on the table. I cried as it died in my palm. Second objective, communicate to someone. I went into the hallway between classes and started calling out familiar students by name. They all had similar reactions, rubbing their ears in one form or another. Third objective, lift a book. So I did, as Chris recorded it with his phone. He played it back to me. I saw myself lift the book and place it at the other end of the table. On the video, the book just appeared on the other side in a blink. We did mundane tests like this for hours, well into the night. Chris and I learned what I'm able to do and what I cannot do. Our hypothesis is that the bilamite injected me with some sort of chemical that we hadn't seen in our analysis of their inner workings. That chemical, due to whatever possible reason, was able to imbue me with the same benefits that the bilamite has, lack of aging. However, it's also placed me in a sort of ethereal time zone, where I can observe the world around me aging and progressing, all the while being absolved from it. We need to find another bilamite. It appears, however, that someone has wiped them from existence. The best is gone. Our specimens are gone. It's like they never existed. Just like me. My house, my belongings, and all of my research have vanished. There's no trace that I existed aside from the memories of people who knew me. I'm a ghost as is Chris. He was killed about eight years ago. Chris was at home in his study when a man in red came up behind him and strangled him with a wire. I tried grabbing the man around the neck, but before I could get close, his dog came from the other room and attacked me, pulling me to the floor. There were so many emotions running through me at that moment but I was stuck on bliss. Bliss for the first physical interaction I had in years. It almost completely overshadowed the horror of my only contact in the outside world and my closest friend being killed. The man in red whistled to his dog once the deed was done and it ceased attacking me. It sat still, in fact, glaring at me with its head tilted to the side. There's others, it spoke to me. The man in red whistled again, and they were gone. I tried calling 911, but the operators couldn't hear me. After almost 10 calls, an officer finally showed up and discovered Chris's body. They ruled his death as suicide. In the years since then, I've focused all of my efforts on finding the others that are like me. Chris, while I do miss him, might have served a greater purpose in his death, and I've come to terms with that now. I need a way out. We weren't making any progress. The man in red and his dog gave me something Chris never could. Hope.